My name is David Martin. I'm a principal at Berkeley Research Group, and I wanted to thank you all for attending this evening what we think will be an extremely interesting event. Our goal in putting forth this seminar was to bring together insight and perspective from differing stakeholders on the same issue. Tonight we'll be able to garner the thinking from a former federal judge and regulator, a renowned corporate litigator, two very experienced expert witnesses on the promise and pitfalls on how an expert witness can impact one's case. Tonight's event will be an interactive discussion, which we hope will elicit lively discourse on key issues and questions. We are honored to have David Gruenstein as our moderator of tonight's discussion. David graduated from Columbia College and received his JD from Harvard Law School. He has been a partner at Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, the litigation department since 1988. His practice includes uh, complex civil litigation, regulatory enforcement matters. He has defended enforcement matters principally bought by securities regulators, and he has handled numerous internal investigations. He has provided compliance-related advice to brokerage houses, investment banks, investment advisors with respect to U.S. and international operations. The clients he serves are primarily large public companies and securities firms. Our first panelist requires very little by way of introduction as his years of service to his country and the bar speaks volumes. Judge Stanley Sporkin has been an innovator and a beacon of prudence during turbulent events for over 50 years. He has served the investing public, the bar, and United States presidents. His career highlights include director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, where he is credited with being the godfather of the FCPA, general counsel of the CIA, U.S. District Court judge, when he was appointed by Ronald Reagan, he was a partner at Wal Gottschall, and presently ombudsman for BP America. The judge, as he is affectionately known, is currently engaged in a specialized law and counseling practice devoted to litigation, mediation, and arbitration services. And he focuses much of his time on issues that deal with uh, financial regulatory enforcement matters, cri crisis avoidance, crisis management, safety issues, and of course, FCPA. The judge is a graduate from Penn State and received his law degree from Yale University. Our next panelist, Charles Lindilius, is a recognized expert on securities-related matters. Charles is often looked upon by counsel to provide his expertise in matters that are often categorized as bet the farm litigation. Charles is the director at Berkeley Research Group and is the head of the financial institution's practice. There he specializes in regulation, in providing advice and guidance to clients regarding the regulation of, and regarding securities trading, broker dealers, investment advisors, hedge funds, insurance companies, and banks. He has over 30 years of professional experience, which includes seven years in investment banking, three years as a CFO of a health and life insurance carrier, reinsurance carrier. He provides consulting and expert testimony in a myriad of securities-related issues, including, uh, but not limited to, securities and accounting fraud, complex investor suitability, insider trading, securities valuation, share price modeling, financial accounting, and internal control standards. Uh, as an expert witness, Mr. Lindelius has testified over 30 times. Uh, when the SEC listed their key cases brought relating to the 2007 financial crisis, Mr. Lindelius has testified or was asked to testify in three of those matters, uh, most notably uh, regarding a consulting engagement when the SEC's Inspector General asked Mr. Lindelius to lead the team investigating the SEC's failure to uncover the Madoff Ponzi scheme. Gladly accepted. Mr. Lundelius is a certified public accountant and is credited in business valuation and certified in financial forensics by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He has held a general securities principal license 24 7 and 63 and was a registered investment advisor. He was a NASDAQ board, he was enlisted and appointed to the NASDAQ board of directors regarding the listing qualifications panel. In 2003, Mr. Lindelius authored Financial Reporting Fraud, a practical guide to the detection internal control, which was uh, released again as a second edition in 2010. Joining this esteemed panel is David Kotz, former Inspector General of the United States, Securities and Exchange Commission, and now a director at Berkeley Research Group and a member of the firm's financial institutions practice group. During his tenure at the SEC, he authored the landmark, widely publicized report investigating the failure of the SEC to uncover 
the Bernard Madoff Ponzi scheme. Mr. Kotz has authored numerous high profile reports of investigation, while they see among others, they included the seven billion alleged Ponzi scheme perpetrated by Alan Sanford, the SEC settlement of enforcement action against the Bank of America, and the widely cited at auto report analyzing the SEC's oversight of Bear Stearns and the reasons for its collapse. He has testified before Congress on numerous occasions, including televised appearances before the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee. His practice at BRG is focused on internal investigations and serving as compliance monitor for firms that have entered into deferred prosecution agreements and other similar arrangements with government agencies. He has served as an expert witness in numerous securities related cases since leaving the SEC and among these are recent examples are serving as an expert witness in a litigation brought in Dublin, Ireland regarding claims that a custodial bank failed to fulfill its fiduciary duties with conduction to a large fraud and as an expert witness in a state court in Missouri on behalf of the law firm regarding claims related to the registration statement uh, in a public offering and its review by the SEC's Division of Corporate Finance. It is our plan over the next uh, hour and change uh, and we will try to be very cognizant of that time. We know that uh, it's important to network as well, uh, to present ideas and raise questions based upon the unique experiences of our moderator and three panelists. So once again, thank you. And I turn the microphone over to my colleague, David Kotz. All right, All right thank you, David. Uh, we thought we'd start with uh, something topical a uh, recent case you may have heard of involving George Zimmerman in Florida. And we are going to show a couple clips with the purpose of that being to demonstrate how you can have effective and not so effective expert testimony and the consequences of uh, whether the testimony is effective or not. Uh, so why don't we just go ahead and roll the first clip. Look at this. You can see there's congestion in the nose and there's an abrasion. But notice how the outline here is a smooth outline. Here, it bulges out and then comes back. And uh, if you then compare it to another photograph, you see that this is consistent with a possible displaced fracture because of the next photo taken of him in police custody, the swell, which is only a few hours later, this swelling is not as prominent. And that's why I believe the EMS thought he had a fractured nose. And uh, you can see there's a swelling right here. It's very prominent. It's just below the area where he's got a small abrasion. Is the injury you see in this exhibit consistent, this is exhibit 79, consistent with having been punched in the nose? Yes. Let's talk about that for a moment. First of all, were you aware that Mr. Zimmerman said that Trayvon Martin was straddling him? Yes, sir. And leaning over him? Yes, sir. And that Mr. Zimmerman had the gun in his right hand? Yes, sir. And if you would describe then what you know about that sequence of events compared with the medical uh, forensic and gunshot evidence. The medical evidence, the gunshot wound, the tattooing, is consistent with his opinion, with his statement as to that. And the reason it is, 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 is don't forget, the simplest thing is the gun was in his right hand. So if you're going to shoot somebody and you're right-handed and you're really close to them, the, uh, this, the natural inclination to, with the twist, the hand, that the bullet will tend to go from the deceased left to his right, okay? But that's a minor point. The most important point is the nature of the defect in the clothing and the powder tattooing. That is, if you lean over somebody, you will notice that the clothing tends to fall away from the chest. If instead you're lying on your back and somebody shoots you, the clothing is going to be against 
your chest. So that the fact that the, we know the clothing was two to four inches away is consistent with somebody leaning over the person doing the shooting and that the clothing is two to four inches away from the person firing. This is in evidence as Exhibit 148, an unopened 23-ounce can of a, uh, a fruit beverage. Yes. Do you find those facts consistent with what you saw as well as consistent with what Mr. Zimmerman said happened? This would tend to reinforce because the reason that the clothes, as you bend forward, the clothing falls away from the body is gravity. Now, if you have wet clothing, clothing's heavier, and there's going to be a greater tendency to fall. And if you have something in the front pulling the shirt down as you lean over, again, it tends to pull away from the body. So, so the, the wound itself, by the gap, by the powder tattooing, uh, in the face of a contact of the clothing, indica uh, indicates that this is consistent with Mr. Zimmerman's account, that he, that uh, Mr. Martin was over him, leaning forward at the time he was shot. All right, so if you see, uh, this is the defense witness, uh, clear, articulate, knowledgeable testimony, effective use of photographs, conclusive, goes to the heart of the issue. Now let's watch uh, the prosecution witness. Right, so you had no idea what anyone had said about what had happened the uh, night before. Uh, we correct? had, normally, I did not remember. I told Ms. Omara during the deposition, I did not have any. Let me be precise with the question. Okay. So you did the autopsy without any knowledge, having reviewed any information about what was supposed to have happened the night before. I was told, again, I do not have any recall. I do not have any memory of the day of autopsy. I cannot answer your any question about that. All I hear is the notes I have. Okay. Let me be sure I understand. Without what you're notes, I cannot tell you any fact. Without notes, I, not, I, not, I cannot tell you any opinion. Okay, okay. what you're saying today and to me and to yes. the jury yes. is that you have no memory yes. of any of the events surrounding the autopsy itself. Yes, is I try very hard. Is that true? It's true, 100 percent true. I try memory. No. Could it be false memory, old, confused memory? Recent. Are memory. you reading from something now? Yeah, yeah, I read that. I, I typed that myself. May, may I see what you're referring to, please? May I approach the witness? Because I puzzled by that. I could not remember the thing, and other nice. people can. Right. May the witness not answer until I've had a chance. Okay. Yes. Show me what you're looking at. Before this testimony, I told you I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours. I typed down potential answers your potential question. This is my notes. May I see them? I, I'd rather you do not see. This is my notes. Nobody saw that before. Okay. I thought Dr. Bell, if you're going to be reading from your notes, um, both attorneys are entitled to see what you're reading from. Okay. So please There's allow no him to do so. You may approach the Think about that for a moment. So you acknowledge that your first opinion was and the one you expressed in writing and at your deposition last November yes. was that it was one to three minutes, correct? Yes, in the deposition and I told you it's one to three minutes Okay. because now, it's my job. If you would let me ask the next, next okay. question. I don't mean to interrupt if you're not finished, but okay. I want to just set the stage. Okay. So it was one to three minutes back in November. Yes. And it continued to be one to three minutes until the last 60 days. Yes, until three weeks ago. Until three weeks ago, and then you changed your opinion Best and expanded time. it to more than twice, almost three times as long, more than three times as long, yeah. from one to ten minutes. Because I have new experience. And that's experience, personal experience? 
Yes, not experience or information that you gain from reviewing journals or articles no. or textbooks. No, it's Your hands-on experience. My hands was not on. My eye was on. 